I'd like to welcome Dr. Sue Sentence. She is the Chief Learning Officer at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, she has an academic background in which she has a particular interest in um, uh, programming and pedagogy. So the fact that the Raspberry Pi Foundation um, is treating their educational work with the kind of seriousness represented by Sue is really important for all of us, not just in this Python community, but everybody who lives in this country and uh, works with in education or has children in, in school, because um, this kind of work and this kind of research is going to be quite important for um, the future of programming and the way we use computers and technology here. So, it really represents the joining together of our interests as a Python community, what the Raspberry Pi Foundation are doing, what the uh, programming education movement has been doing in this country. So please uh, warmly welcome uh, Sue Sentence, and uh, we'll hear what you have to say. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, good morning, and thank you for inviting me and, I'm, and for sh coming, showing up on an early on a Sunday morning after your conference dinner. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here, especially on Educate Today. Um, I'd just like to ask, um, before I start, how many educators and teachers there are in the audience? Quite a few. Anybody else who volunteers at Clo Club, Clo Clubs and that sort of thing? So you're educators too. Um, that's great. So uh, my background, um, originally I was a programmer and then I went into um, research and AI and stuff. Then I became a teacher and I taught for many years in school. Then I became a teacher trainer. And um, I feel very passionately about teaching and about ways of teaching, about teaching computing. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I've recently joined the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which is marvellous, and have some of my colleagues, new colleagues here, um, which is great. And previously I was at King's College London, so what I'm talking about today is some of the things that I was doing there. So, the title of the talk is um, uh, What's in a Teacher's Toolkit? And, we're gonna, and even if you're um, not a teacher, hopefully you'll find this useful. But if you are just about to um, drop off or go onto your emails or anything. I always like to give us like a short version so you get the sort of the, the, in the first one minute or so. So the short version is, this is my passion. I feel very strongly about this, that we need to get better at introducing programming to young novices. Uh, we are getting there, but we don't always do a very good job. Um, and if you look at all the research on teaching programming at university, we didn't actually do, there was a lot of, um, um, uh, uh, problems there too, so we don't always do a job generally. There are some underlying principles. Some of this come from research and some come from all the teachers, all the teachers that are here in the room, your kind of experience that you've got in the classroom all um, add to that. And even if this is not your bag, hopefully what I'm talking about today will resonate in some of the way you teach yourself or that you learn or reflect on how you do this or any, any volunteer activities you do. That's the short version for those people who um, um, want it up front. An even shorter version is there is this idea that some people can program and some people can't program. Uh, that this is a thing called the geek gene. Excuse my really bad uh, attempt at doing a bimodal graph. Um, that's if we have invested in England, anyway, in a national curriculum that has computing as a mandatory, that, you know, that means everybody has to do it from 5 to 16, part of that, compute, that, prog that curriculum is computer programming, just like for maths and English. We don't believe that some people can't do reading and writing. Some people will never be able to do basic maths. Similarly, the essence of the new curriculum is that this is possible for everybody. There is no such thing as a you can't do it. So we have to have that mindset. Okay, so what I want to, what I meant to warn you earlier is a little bit of audience work to do in this talk. Three bits, hopefully. This is number one. So uh, the first thing I'd like you to do is talk, turn around to your neighbor, introduce yourself if you don't know who they are, and tell them 
how you, when you first learned to program, what you did, how you did it. Okay, you've got two minutes. And by the way, I'm a teacher, so when I put my hand up like that, you've got to stop talking. Yeah, 10 minutes would be good. Well, about, about five past 10. <laughs> no one's looking. Now, when you're a teacher, you say, when you're a teacher, you go five, four, three, two. This is what we do in school. And by one, I expect complete silence. There we go. Perfect. Um, so, I, this is too difficult for me to take answers from you about how you learn to program. So, I've got some, some possibilities on the, on, the on, the, on the board, on the, um, on the slide. <laughs> Getting into... <laughs> Um, so, did any of you have an inspirational teacher? Nobody. <laughs> ah. Yes, fantastic. Any of you learn from a book? Yep. Anybody learn like in the middle of the night on their own, like, you know? Oh, that's a bit. Okay. I'm not sure about the difference between this one, it's like the same in the daytime. Uh, <laughs> And uh, anybody learn with, with collaborating with other people and working together and all that sort of thing? Great. Okay. You might gather I'm quite keen on this one here. Okay. So th thinking about how you learn to program is really important when you start teaching programming. And teachers do, when they go in, and I've done a lot of teacher training, teachers take... It's, it's very embedded in your, in, in, you know, in your sort of early memories about how you were taught, and some of those, uh, the, the, the sort of the ways that you were taught, really affect how you think about the approaching other, uh, the teaching that you do. So it's always really good to reflect on that, and then then think that actually that might not be the best way, and be open to um, new ideas. Okay. So before I get onto the teacher's toolkit, which is the main bit of my talk, I've got six kind of strategies. I'm going to look at why we do have problems um, sometimes in school, uh, helping children to understand um, basic programming concepts. So why programming can be difficult. And I've just got a few um, suggestions, and these are, uh, are based on research. I didn't put references on there. I thought this wasn't... The, the place, um, but I've got references if anyone's interested. So first of all, um, we all form, a when, we're, when, we, when we run a program, we have a mental model of how that executes, of how the computer works, what's happening. And for many um, children learning program, that isn't actually the same as what is really happening. And that causes all sorts of, of problems, and it's very difficult for teachers to detect what the difference is between the, uh, the child's mental model and, and what's actually happening. Um, and quite a lot of children do think there is, they do um, initially think there's something magic going on, which is an extreme case of that. But later on, I'm going to talk about misconceptions that um, people might have. And it's important when you're, when you're teaching a program to be able to understand what they are and be able to address those when you're teaching. That's number one. Number two. When we're thinking about writing, doing um, uh, programming, we're, we are thinking at least three different levels of abstraction. So at the top level, we're thinking about the problem we want to solve, what the function is, what we want to do. There's a middle level where we try and think of that in sort of computer speak. We think about an algorithm for that. And then there's a nitty gritty level where we're putting colons in and um, indenting correctly. I was going to say curly brackets. <laughs> um, I am a Python programmer, don't worry. Um, so, and there's some research done between that called by Quentin Cutts in Glasgow called the Abstra Abstraction Transition Taxonomy, which talks about the fact that we, we have problems unless we um, signal 
where we are on those, on those different layers and that we could talk to uh, anybody that's learning about which layer they're actually working at at the time. Um, thirdly, one, um, uh, we, we compress concepts and we don't unpick them enough and we expect people to pick up multiple things at once. You know, we've got a, a simple line of code, hope there's no errors in it, um, that um, has got something that you might do really early on, got in it variables, functions, strings, all sorts of things. Isn't that a, a lot of stuff to teach in, in no wonder we get confused. Um, fourthly, I feel quite strongly about this, um, when, we, when we learn to read and write, we learn to, uh, we, 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 we learn to read. We don't write essays before we've started reading something. And the same with programming, um, with programs. Uh, we should be thinking that, that we know how to read programs before we start um, uh, entertaining people with big blank idle windows. Um, so, and we also ask students to copy in code uh, when they don't really have uh, much um, idea about what it's doing, and I've sat in the back of lessons when children have, have, have been trying to copy in a program, don't really know what it does, it can take them the whole lesson to try and get frustrated with all the errors in it, and it's not really very good use of their time. Fifthly, is about resilience. You know, we all know that programs don't work first time. Um, uh, there's a sort of uh, a mindset that, that, that thinks that things should work if I'm doing well, if I'm working hard. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm conscientious, it should go well. So it's very hard to, um, when things don't work. And to do that, you need confidence. You need to have some belief in yourself. You need emotional resilience. All those things which are just evolving when you're young and when you're old, too. So that um, there is a direct relationship between what we call self-efficacy, which is believing yourself, and programming um, uh, performance. And one of my PhD students is looking at that at the moment. So those are the kind of um, problems that we have. Just an illustration of the sort of misconceptions that people have about programming. Um, uh, trying not to have a plug, but there's a chapter in a book that I've just been involved in um, that's got 41 misconceptions that students in school might have about, uh, uh, and, and others around the place, might have about how, programs, how programming works. And... Um, if, if you're walking around with one of these misconceptions, that can really affect your progress and everything at school. And in science, teachers, we've been, we've been doing research in science education for years, teachers know about the misconceptions, they teach around them, they highlight them. In computing education in schools, this is all new to us. We are just developing, and, and 41 is, is not an exhaustive or exhaustive list. So um, there, there are many misconceptions that, that students may, may have. Okay, and also we're teaching a different concept. Excuse my gross generalization on the left-hand side of this slide. Um, but I'm trying to uh, uh, focus on the, the uh, right-hand side of the slide. So when we're teaching in school, you may have a block of eight weeks when you're doing your programming bit. Is that right, Claire? And then you might have one lesson a week. And then, uh, and, then, and then the teacher says, you turn up on Monday afternoon, the teacher says, now, do you remember when we did four loops? And it's, you know, all sorts of things have happened in that time. Life has happened, lots of different subjects. Of course, you can't remember when you did four loops. So uh, you, you, your teacher has 30 kids at once. Uh, the teacher may be still you know, a few pages ahead in the book. And the, the, uh, so it's, it's, a diff it's a completely different scenario to possibly when you learned to program. And I asked you at the beginning how you learned to program. So um, and just, just have a, a mind for how how challenging this is, this is in school and how we need to work on getting that better and making it better for teachers. Okay? Um, I found out we're on YouTube, so my lovely children have got big squares on their eyes. That's why, they, that's why they, um, you can't see them anymore. Um, but, uh, and in, in, not in the Welsh uh, curriculum, I think Tom Crick talked to you last year about Wales. Um, in the Ingling, in the Computing curriculum in England, we do have quite uh, we have we have programming quite an early age. So just to show you, it's, sometimes it's quite good when you look at the the picture of the child who's learning and then what they're learning. Kind of brings home that actually this is quite a lot. Of seven to eleven year olds using sequence selection repetition. Um, eleven to fourteen year olds, you know, possibly learning lists, tables, subroutines. Um, so 
you know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot that we're, we're expecting of our teachers and our children, and we need to know about um, getting this right. And finally, before I get onto the teacher's toolkit, um, so there is the mindset that programming is only for some. There is a, a tendency to think, all oh, those people who are good at maths who go on to do GCC computer science because there's an obvious link. Um, so, and then there's another thing, which is a bit of my bugbear, really, that we just need more software tools, or we just need more of this. We don't, we just need fantastic teachers. Um, so I have a, a colleague at King's who talks about the pedagogy being embedded in the, in the tool, and if you make a really good tool, then that's fine. Uh, it's really helpful, but actually it's the teacher that is working with the tool. It's the teacher that is um, there on a daily basis helping the students with programming. So um, uh, this is why we're talking about the, the teacher's toolkit today. Okay, so I haven't got a watch or anything like that, but I think I know how time it is. So I'm going to talk through um, these six uh, strategies that teachers might use uh, to teach um, novice programmers quite young in the classroom, most of which there is um, emerging research that this is worth doing. And I'm very happy to take questions on this at the end. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to go through these six, but there are others. I've just picked lots of things beginning with P. Um, so uh, we'll go through them individually. Started with pair programming, I imagine uh, those of you who are developers that you're quite familiar with um, uh, pair programming as an idea. Um, so there's a lot of evidence about pair programming. It started in industry, then it got used in higher education, and now it's being used in school. And there's increasing evidence that it's, um, that it's very valuable for young children um, learning. And whereas we did in the previous curriculum we had, had a great fixation on having enough computers in the room so that we could have one person on every computer, and that was a real goal. And now we want less computers in the room, so we have to share, because that's better pedagogy. So um, you have in pair program, if you haven't come across it, one driver and one navigator, or a pilot and navigator. So somebody um, is, is at the keyboard, and, and, but there is a lot of discussion going on. In school, we change roles every 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and the, the, uh, they can be looking at an algorithm or a program, but they're talking about the problem. It's the talking that's really important. The pairing is also important. And there's some guidance online for teachers about how to pair children effectively that they work well. Um, in the classroom, it's really important that the teacher models could practice, that they point at the screen, that they talk through as well, that a model is talking about the program. Um, a teacher should never take the mouse or the keyboard from a child. It's in their, it's in their personal space. It, it's, it's theirs. So with that, without asking them. So I think that the, then the teacher helps the, um, the pair programming process. So that's my first um, strategy to talk th through, and uh, um, hopefully that's something that you're quite familiar with. Number two, the second one I was going to look at is use, modify, create, which you may not have um, come across before. So use, modify, create, though, it's not very difficult to work out what that means. Um, it means use, the pro use a program first, then modify it, and then create your own program. So the value of that, if you look at the research, is that you've got this transfer of ownership from the, it's not mine to start with, so it doesn't work, it's not my fault. If I, if, I, um, uh, f if, if I gradually understand what it does, then I can take over ownership and I gain confidence with that. And this particularly works, I think, with physical computing. I've done training with a microbit where the microbit's already, well, whenever I do training with a microbit, the microbit's already loaded with a program. You don't give somebody a microbit that doesn't do anything and start them off typing away. You give them a microbit that's got a program on it, task is, look at it together, can you work out what it might do? Press some buttons, what does it do? Work out what it does first, and then look at the code to see, ah, oh, that, that means that that's how it does that, that's how it does that, and then you can change that to do more effective things. So it's a really nice um, way of working, 
and I've used that in my uh, own work, which I'll talk about a bit later on. And, and giving them a program to use doesn't mean giving them code on a piece of paper and saying, type it in. It means giving them a program to use, a running program. So use modify create is nice, and it's got a nice kind of ring about it. It's easy to remember. Um, the next one we talk about is some research that I've been doing, and uh, it's called Prim, and uh, which well, my, te my student teachers came up with this acronym after a lot of mulling around with it. Um, and Prim uses some of these um, other areas of research that I'm going to talk about. So, and this is your second task. So. Um, turn to your neighbor again, get ready, I'm going to give you a task. Okay? So, prim, the P in prim stands for predict. So, I'm going to put a little bit of code, and remember this is for children, I know you're all developers, it's very easy. Um, the uh, uh, written in Python turtle, um, and see if you can work out, maybe draw on a little piece of paper, what you think this would do. Piece of paper on the back of your hand or something. So what would that? So you've got two minutes again to look at the code and see what the output would be. I don't want you to explain it. Just what, when you run that, what will it look like on the screen? Go. Yeah, sure. getting the hang of it now. Okay. So I've seen a lot of people doing this. So I imagine you're sort of along the lines, but I want to, before I tell you what the answer is, um, what kind of discussions did you have? Think about the sort of, the communication that you were having with the, the person next to you. Were you, um, did you learn anything from the person next to you? What was their approach at solving the problem? Did they trace through the code or did they, did they um, you know, how, how did you do it together and how did you, you talk about it? So think about how valuable those conversations were and then did you get that? Oh, you're all the clever developers. Um, it does catch people out, um, this one. It's the funny thing about what left means. Um, but again, you know, if we... So, but the point of, of um, doing that is uh, that the predict phase of prim is partly about um, the discussion that you have. You know, looking at a piece of code thinking about how you work out what it might do, having a go at, at, at predicting it, and then what I would do next, the R is run, is then you give students the code. Before you tell them the answer, you give them the code, and you say, run it. Does it do the same as you think? And then work out why you thought it did something differently. So, and the discussion is really important. We've been doing some research on this, and the teachers all talk about um, students using um, programming language better, learning the vocabulary, getting the confidence from finding out that somebody else is asking the same questions as them. So um, uh, predict and run is quite useful. So PRIM is uh, basically a way of structuring programming lessons for teachers that use it. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything particularly um, original in it, it uses lots of other ideas and research to put together to help teachers structure lessons so they use the time valuably, valuably, valuably. Sorry, I've got that word wrong. So it includes reading code before you write code, includes the sort of working collaboratively you have in um, uh, um, programming, 
The I is investigate, which is, is unpacking and understanding the program, which we do to reduce the cognitive load. Cognitive load is when you're um, a concept by a guy called Sweller, which is when you're thinking, you've got too much information, you've got too much to think about, and you can't, um, uh, you, you be become less effective in what you're, you're working on. Um, it uses existing starter programs, so that just picking up on the use, modify, create, gradually taking ownership of programs. And a lot of the feedback from teachers has been around the conversations and things that they've had. So PRIM stands for predict, run, investigate, modify, and make. We've talked about the predict and the run. And then investigate is uh, in the, in the, after the, the initial bit, when you've talked about, you've looked at code and you've run it and you've thought about it, then you need to work out what the individual bits of code do. So that's getting down at the, the, um, the bottom level of abstraction that I was talking about before. So it's signaling there were different levels of abstraction. And you think, thinking, and that you have to specially design questions that um, focus on uh, the, um, sort of individual bits of code, bigger pieces of code, flow of control, tracing, and you can do lots of different activities uh, in investigate to help students understand what the code is actually doing. Then modifying the code means that you then, of course, it doesn't the code that you've given isn't probably that. Interesting, you can make it do much more interesting things. You can fix any sort of um, logical errors that are in there. You can change the function of it. And then eventually you get to the create, the make, um, when you design a new program. And it is important, although I talk a lot about um, unpicking and that sort of thing, and that we haven't, we haven't forgotten that programming is about creating, and it is important that you reach this. Uh, stage where students then explore and create their own programs. But in a world where there's a focus a lot on, oh, let's see what you can make, let's have an idea and do it, um, often uh, the, the limit of your understanding limits how much you can create. So you have to build on the understanding to make the create bit um, better. So that's Prim. I've got a few examples of resources and things we have. I'm building a WordPress site with lots of materials on that, so teachers who've been using Prim can add their own materials. So, so giving it's all our resources are in Python. Students have um, programs to predict at the beginning of lessons, and they can put their answers on whiteboards or draw them on pieces of paper. And then uh, they, we ha they, they have a little box to write the answers in. And then the, the, the teacher uses shared drives to be able to share starter programs. So you always have a starter program. And I did this when I was teaching back. I always had starter programs for my students, something to start with, because of this kind of horrible thing about starting with a blank sheet. And then you get to investigate, and I haven't got many examples of investigate. There's loads of different things that you can do. You know, what would what would be the value of this variable? What would what would what um, would happen if you traced it, what happens if you run it and you don't put any data in, um, and, and just lots of questions about the, about the um, data and the, the program. So then we get on to modify, and there are lots of different examples of these, so depending on what the, quest the, the, the program was that we're doing, uh, you'll then give examples of things that are doing something that uh, build functionality into the program. And um, then finally, you get on to making something of your own that's new or your own idea or something. And um, in our uh, research, we need to build on um, the expectation that teachers do spend time on this phase rather than keep spending all their time predicting and running and things like that. It's, it's a teacher's toolkit means you have lots of strategies. Teachers will um, use uh, a range of different strategies at different times. So it's about giving teachers lots of things that they can try. So that's PRIM. So we've got three down, three to go. Um, has anyone heard of um, peer instruction? Yeah, fantastic. Um, peer instruction was um, invented by a physicist called Eric Mazur in 1991, and uh, 
is a, another teaching strategy that's been used successfully in different subjects. It's been taken up in computing and used very effectively. And this is another, ex this is another task that you have to do, audience. Um, this time, and, and, and I'm afraid I haven't got any props. You're supposed to have clickers and ABCD cards. And I haven't got any props. But this time, you need to think on your own before you turn to your partner, and then I'll ask you to turn to your partner. OK? So here's your question. So look at this code and see if the answer is either A, B, C, or D. And imagine you just got a lesson on true and false. And OK, have you decided? So in free instruction, what you do now is hold up your individual card, but I'm not going to do that. So now turn to your neighbor and see what they thought and if they thought the same as you. And imagine you're in year eight, you're 12, and this is hard. <laughs> Okay, stop there. <coughs> so now, uh, having reached a consensus, and you have to agree, um, you would then vote as in pairs or threes or fours. So hands up whose who's group thought it was D, C, B, A. Okay, you're not in year eight. <laughs> so, uh, um, but uh, the idea of peer instruction, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a combination of flipped learning, which means the teacher sets the students the, 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 the work to do before the lesson to study the topic and gives materials. Then they come into class and they have a very um, cleverly designed multiple choice questions where the other options are misconceptions that the, the teacher is aware of. And the... Uh, the, the um, actually, writing really good multiple choice questions like that is incredibly hard. Writing really bad, simple m multiple choice questions is easy. Um, so uh, they, they need to be good and to, to, to elicit those misconceptions. Then the student, um, then the people vote individually that about the, um, what they think the answer is. Then they discuss and they vote as a group and then they discuss as a class. And providing you pick the right questions and you've done the right pre-learning, it's, it's a really effective way of learning and there's a lot of research around it. And there is some, there's a website there that focuses on computer science questions for peer instruction. And I would definitely, I've got, had a student this year looking at doing it with year 11, which is 15 year olds. There's not much research about using it in school at the moment. I think it's definitely something that um, we should be thinking about as teachers using more in school, especially as we now have large banks of multiple choice questions to use. So that's peer instruction. I want you, by the way, to vote on your favorite by the end, so I hope you're remembering them all. Fourth one, worked examples, plus there's an extra bit on worked examples with subcoals. Worked examples is fairly straightforward, it's worked examples. Um, but uh, the idea of a worked example is that uh, the, the you um, go through a sort of pro problem that you would like, it's about problem solving, a sort of pro problem that you'd like a student to, uh, to solve, and you work through it step by step with the class. Um, there, it's a, uh, um, theoretically, it draws on research in cognitive apprenticeship, which is when uh, you know, experts work alongside, you know, master baker works with apprentice baker, you know, experts work with novices side by side, and you explain your um, 
reasoning and how you tackle problems. Um, there is software, that, software tools that do this, but as you know, I think teach is better. Um, so, and then there's another version of it called sub-goal made, made labeling, which is a, a, a prominent researcher called Mark Gosdile, who uh, does write a lot about this, where the worked example is, has um, uh, labels of what you're doing each time, and there's some research to show that that's even better than worked examples. So I've got um, a small, um, you can't read all that, but I, and I pinched it anyway from my friends in Glasgow. Um, so, it, so, so just to illustrate that you might have a problem like, I have a program, it asks for three numbers, calculates the total and average displays information. You, that's broken down into six steps. You would talk through the steps with, the, with your students, gradually get them to build up a plan, break down the plan even more, and it's a really good way of like, uh, decomposing the problem and, 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 and tackling it bit by bit. So all the things I'm talking about are, as I've said, you know, different strategies that you can use at different times um, if you're a teacher. So the last one um, is Parsons problems. Anyone heard of Parsons problems or Parsons puzzles? One, two, one and a half. Um, so Parsons problems are quite interesting. Um, because basically, they're, uh, they've also a lot of research that this is quite useful. You, you present the program in different order, and then you have to reorder the lines of code to put them in the right order. Um, and in doing that, you're actually having to say, ah, well, where do I come into this, and, and what's, in, in, what's indented, and um, am I you know, thinking about the variable, initializing variables, and all that sort of thing. So it's interesting. Um, there are, there are. Um, this is taken from a, a, a computer science work on RuneStone, um, where you can. There's lots of tools where you can sort of do Parsons problems. They're quite useful to have. Teachers can do it on the whiteboard, and do it on bits of paper. Quite a fan of bits of paper, um, but actually it's quite. They, they're very useful for. Um, that they're actually useful for, useful for assessing what students know as a way of, ass of assessing. And I wish exam boards would use passing problems rather than presenting students with big blank bits of paper and saying, write an algorithm. So um, the, they're an, an interesting uh, approach that you can use in programming. OK, so um, that's my six. So just to, so I'm coming to the end. I don't know what time it is, but it's. Um, Right, okay, coming to the end. So um, just to summarize, those are the six things I um, had put in my teacher's toolkit, strategies that you, could, you can think about. And some of the things that the principles that they abide by are this idea of we've got to break down the task. Um, a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old learning um, a bit of Python is not the same as a university student. We've got to use examples, we've got to work together, get students working together, we've got to read code before, before writing, or at least in parallel. And the outcome is that you reduce the cognitive load, you, give, you help students to develop the right mental model, you give them confidence, and attitudinal and effective things are so important in programming. If you get the, the idea that you're not good at something, that stays with you for a long time. Um, it gives you a good use of vocabulary, you it's a way of understanding the terms, and gives you the idea about understanding what level of abstraction you are. And those are the, each of those strategies does, though, does each of those things in different ways, but um, uh, as, a, as a set of strategies, I think that would be um, a good, good start. So, um, I'm going to ask you the last quick question before I go on to my last slide. Turn to your neighbor and tell them what your favorite one is. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs>
Okay, that's at least 30 seconds. Okay, who likes, who likes pair programming? Who likes use, modify, create? Oh, like that. Who likes, you only have to vote for one. Who likes prim? You don't have to say it just because I. Uh, peer instruction? Ooh, not so popular. Worked examples? Good. Parsons problems? Good idea. Okay, so the top end was more, was more what we, but, but as a toolkit, we're going to um, use all of those things at different stages of, of, of teaching. So just finally, so I'm finishing now, final um, shout out to all the teachers um, uh, that are here. So whatever, we, we rely so much on teachers, whatever subject um, is being taught, whatever the teacher's teaching, German or history or computing, whatever, they have what they call pedagogical content knowledge, it's called. And that's the, the skills that they, they um, have in teaching their own subject, strategies that they have. And we have you know, lots of stuff that will help teachers, but basically, you will... Um, the, we, we, we owe so much to teachers in school teaching programming right now because they are going to influence everything that happens in the future and whether the computing curriculum is a success. And so I'd just like you to give a big clap and shout out for teachers, any teachers in the room. Thank you. And um, um, I'm now open to a few questions and uh, uh, do help do discuss with me later, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do I do my own questions? Question uh, here? Oh. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm just sorry, out the microphone. So, yes, uh, you, thank you for a great talk and you're taking questions. Not difficult ones. There's another mic at the back. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, what's that? Will teachers in the United Kingdom ever receive the respect and the rewards that they are due? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is not a politics talk. <laughs> Handled relevant. like a politician. Very relevant, um, yeah. <laughs> Are the visual programming languages, I'm thinking of Scratch, a useful stepping stone to the text-based programming languages you've mostly talked about today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, yeah, so, so there's another talk that I could, about how, you know, visual programming helps and then how you can transition between the two and, and, and move on to text-based programming. Um, there's some research. Um, being done, there's a guy called David Vintrop who does a lot of research in this area, looking about how not only do, do students feel more, um, they sort of not only feel more confident when they're learning block with block-based languages, but they also learn things quicker. There's a kind of a time factor in there than the time it takes to understand with text-based programming. So um, very, very valuable. We are learning teaching children from five till 16. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a perfectly timed talk for me. Um, I teach first year undergraduates, some of whom have done no programming at all before, and some of whom have programmed in at least one language. So I've got a very wide variation. Mm. I wonder if you've got any suggestions about how best to implement these, this toolkit making best accommodation for and use of that difference in skills? Well, one of the things that the, uh, the teachers doing the PRIM trial have said, that, that because in school we have a huge, we have also a, a very wide variety, is that um, when you, it's, it's about differentiating and the sort of questions that you're asking in that investigate stage. So you, you have to sort of structure different questions because you can get really challenging and, and, and differentiate the activities so that you have more open-ended and, and more challenging things, more challenging questions built in. Um, I mean, in school, we do this sort of naturally. We have to sort of differentiate our materials up and down. Um, so that's what I would recommend. I think pair programming can work with 
mixed ability groups. It's more about the attitude that you have to working together that actually, um, if, if, if that helps. Yeah. So just to follow on from that, when you've got a mixed ability uh, group, um, how do you pair them up? It's, yeah, it's a really, it's a really good, it's really important that in pair programming that students work well together. So, um, Alan O'Donoghue, who isn't here today, um, talks about going on holiday to the Lake District. This is, I pinched this example from him completely. Going on holiday to the Lake District. So some people like to sit in a tea room all day. Some people want to climb the highest mountains. And if you put the pair of those two people together, they might not have a very nice holiday. So the two people together who like sitting in tea rooms, two people together like sitting, like sitting climbing up mountains, then, you, what, then if you pair people with, with similar approaches. So that means you need to get to children like choosing, choosing pairs. So sometimes you have uh, methods like write down three people you'd like to work with. And then, you know, you, you just do some kind of amazing algorithm that works out that everybody's got a partner. And so, the, so that um, uh, rather, or, you know, use that kind of experience that you've got. Because some people don't work so well in pairs and others, and they work in different ways. So that would be my suggestion. Hi. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, how much importance do you, um, teachers put on the kind of reading of other people's code uh, as to writing and or thinking about the problem solution. Like, it's, you know, you don't want the kids to kind of have a fixed way of working with things and you want them to kind of explore, right? Yeah. So as I said at the beginning, so for start, when you say what do teachers do, every teacher, there is no typical teacher. Teachers do different things. Teachers are all different. Um, but uh, some of the resources that we have available emphasize uh, reading first, some emphasize writing first, teachers do different things. What I'm trying to emphasize, not that you shouldn't explore and create and that sort of thing, there's a, there's a, um, a, a room for that, but that you need to build in other strategies as well. So one of my colleagues um, has a, con uh, which I didn't put up today, has a continuum of sort of copy code at one end and exploring and tinkering and bricolage and sort of uh, at the other end, and various stops, and you just need to be going, I'm down this continuum, you need to be doing bits of everything, because students are different too, you know, they like doing things in different ways, so I think variety is, is the key. Okay, I know there's a lot more questions that we all want to ask Sue, but I, I think we should, uh, we should stop there in preparation for the next session. Um, I'm guessing, Sue, you're, you're still going to be around if people yes, want to... Yes, I'm around, yeah, thank you. So yeah, let's let's thank her again for a fantastic talk.